One of the games which literary critics play is called categories. They've often played categories with today's poet, Brian Patton. Because he comes from Liverpool, he's been dumped into a sort of container marked the Liverpool Poets. But he's nothing like the other poets from Liverpool, Adrian Henry, Roger McGough, or any of them. Brian's also been called a pop poet. That's also an unhelpful label, even though he certainly is the most popular of the younger poets in Britain. I think the only category that's anywhere near the mark is love poet. His poems are about the birth, life and death of love. When I first heard him, I didn't realize how good his poems were, mainly because I was listening to his voice, envying his ability to make music simply by speaking lines. It was only later that I realized what the music was saying. Then I woke up to the fact that Brian is, as far as I know, the best British poet to be born since the war. He was born in 1945. Already he's published two collections of poems, Little Johnny's Confession and Notes to the Hurrying Man. And this autumn, his third book of poems, The Irrelevant Song, comes out. You have to watch Patton closely. He's something of a magician. I once heard him read in a converted barn in a university. He was just towards the end of a reading and he was reading beautifully. And it was his last poem and it was about singing. And then there was a sudden interruption. A whole gang of sparrows in the rafters of the barn decided to burst into song. So Brian stopped reading in the middle of his poem, pointed upwards so we'd listen to the sparrows. And that was the end of the reading. Brian Patton. This first poem is called Little Johnny's Confession. And see the barred child growing up or shrinking. I've never decided which. Little Johnny's Confession. This morning, being rather young and foolish, I borrowed a machine gun my father had left hidden since the war, went out and eliminated a number of small enemies. Since then, I've not returned home. This morning, swarms of police with tracker dogs wander about the city with my description printed on their minds, asking, have you seen him? Is seven years old, likes Pluto, Mighty Mouse, and Biff over Bar. Have you seen him anywhere? This morning, sitting alone in a strange playground, muttering, you've blundered, you've blundered, over and over to myself, I work out my next move, but cannot move. The tracker dogs will sniff me out. They've got my lollipops. This next poem is called Party Piece. And it's events after an all-night party. He said, let's stay here now, this place is emptied and make gentle pornography with one another while the party goers go out and the dawn creeps in like a stranger let us not hesitate over what we know or over how cold this place has become but let's unclip our minds and let tumble free the mad mangled crocodiles of love so they did, right there among the woodbines and the Guinness stains. And later he caught a bus, and she caught a train. And all there was between them then was rain. Um, there's another poem called Ode on Celestial Music, which is a kind of warning to poets and to painters and artists not to ignore certain things I mean the fact that the work must be like anchored in the ground Ode on Celestial Music it's not celestial music it's the girl in the bathroom singing you can tell although it's winter the trees outside her window have grown leaves all manner of flowers push up through the floorboards 
I think. What a filthy trick that is to play on me. I snip them with my scissors, shouting, I want only bona fide celestial music. Hearing this, she stops singing. Out of her bath now, the girl knocks on my door. Is my singing disturbing you? She smiles, entering. Did you say it was licentious or sensual? And excuse me, my bath towel slipping. A warm and blonde creature. I slam the door on her breast, shouting, I want only bona fide celestial music. Much later on in life, I wear my earring aid. What have I done to my body, ignoring it? Splitting things into so many pieces, my hands can't mend anything. The stars, the buggers, remain silent. Down in the bathroom now, her daughter is singing. Turning my earring aid full volume, I bend close to the floorboards, hoping for at least one song to come through. I read a couple of love poems. The first, the first one is called Into My Mirror Has Walked. Into my mirror has walked a woman who will not talk of love or of its subsidiaries, but who stands there pleased by her own silence. The weather has worn into her all seasons known to me. In one breast she holds evidence of forests, in the other of seas. I will ask her nothing, yet would ask so much if she gave some sign. Her shape is common enough, enough shape to love. But what keeps me here is what glows beyond her. Sometimes I think a boy's body would be as easy to read light into. Sometimes I think my own might do. Another love poem. Evening and the sun warming the bird in their cupped hands. Over the room silence, over voices and sounds. My love, the world is a distant planet. And bending here you are naked. Wind from the half open skylight hardens breasts. Your blonde hair falling is spread out across me. Let our touchings be open. We do not belong to a race of pale children whose bodies are hardly born, nor among the virgins hung still inside the sadness, but waking in strange beds we are screwed and perfect. Littered about the room still are the clothes we wore for meeting in, evening and the sun has moved across the room. Now we will either sleep, lie still, or dress again. Mm. Next poem is about imagination. And there's a creature called Rayuan speaking. The poem's called Rayuan. A creature you will not bother to name, but that can name itself in anything. I push up through the stems of flowers and step out onto lawns. I am a star swan. I'm newly frozen rain cracking under paws. I am imagination, brushing against railings they glow. I leave light in trees. Know not whether it's a lawn or a universe I'm crossing. So be quiet to my friend. Do not talk too much of me. Some vision of this planet might come and go while you put into words my wonder. I am whatever wakes you from comfortable beds to come shivering, nightgowns around you to press faces against freezing cloud. 
And I am what you step towards in wonder, a rainbow found breathing in butchers, the first creature seeing through mist new planets floating. I follow the ant in its tree trunk wild. I am imagination. When I enter your women they glow. You would pull curtains back on them that heaven might see its only rivals. Are you watching, here with the lawns in your noses? Whatever shape I take, I will not call you. I am most time silence. In my immensity wander all your senses. I am the paradise never lost. Only you must evaporate before reaching me. Um, the next poem is a kind of black comedy, I suppose. It's a thing I wish would actually happen. It's called Interruption at the Opera House. It's a sort of fable as well. At the very beginning of an important symphony, while the rich and famous were settling into their quietly expensive boxes, a man came crashing through the crowd, carrying in his hand a cage in which the rightful owner of the music sat, yellow and tiny and very poor, and taking onto the rostrum this rather timid bird, he turned up the microphone and it sang. Very original beginning to the evening, said the crowds, quietly glancing at the programs to find the significance of the intrusion. Meanwhile, at the box office, the organizers of the evening were arranging for small and uniformed attendants to evict even forcefully the intruders. But as the attendants, poor and gathered from the nearby slums at little expense, went rushing down the aisle to do their job, they heard above the coughing an irritable rattle of jewels, a sound that filled their heads with light, and from somewhere inside them bubbled up a stream and there came a breeze on which the youth was carried. How sweetly the bird sang. And though soon the fair up crowds were leaving their boxes, and in confusion were winding their way home, still the attendant sat in the aisles, and some so delighted with what they heard, rushed out to call their families and friends. In all the tenement blocks, the lights were clicking on, and the rightful owner of the music, tiny but no longer timid, sang for the rightful owners of the song. Yeah, um. The next poem again is a love poem. It's a poem called Through All Your Abstract Reasoning and it's from The Irrelevant Song, which is a book that's coming out soon. Through All Your Abstract Reasoning. Coming back one evening through deserted fields when the birds, drowsy with sleep, have all but forgotten you, you stop and for one moment jerk alive. Something has passed through you that alters and enlightens. Realization of what is gone and what was real. A bleak and uncoded message whispers down all your nerves. You cared for her, for love you cared. Something has passed a finger through all your abstract reasoning. From love you sheltered outside of love, but still the human bit leaked in, stunned and off-balanced you. Unprepared, struck so suddenly by another's identity, how can you hold unto any revelation? You have moved too carefully through your life, always the light within you, 
is hooded by your own protecting fingers. Poem that's more or less in the same mood. It's called The Morning's Got a Sleepy Head. Again, it's a love poem. The morning's got a sleepy head. It brings parcels of mist, dreams freshly woven, bright mad gifts it's left on their pillow. They move together, slower even than the sun, but above the woods rising, learning not to hurry or bypass the smallest of sensations. They go to a lust and tenderness of words, and words are meaningless. They've reason for wanting to follow each other out across the morning, out to where the hazel opens and the grass is softest flame. Forever is one light behind them that fill the summer, spilt over into autumn with aches that dropped when each it lost the need to care quite hard enough. Things go too quickly or else they dullen. Quick as the autumn marigold skates the borders of whitening grass, things go and nothing seems replaced. The gap one makes in leaving is not filled. The morning's got a sleepy head. It brings parcels of mist. Dreams newly frozen, bright mad gifts it's left on their pillow. <coughs> I read two short poems, which, I don't know, people seem to like these for some reason, they're popular. Um, first one's called The Projectionist Nightmare. This is The Projectionist Nightmare. A bird finds its way into a cinema, finds a beam, flies down it, smashes into a screen depicting a garden, a sunset, and two people being nice to one another. Real blood, real intestines sliver down the likeness of a tree. This is no good, screams the audience. This is not what we came to see. A poem called A Small Dragon. I suppose in a way it's a love poem again. I found a small dragon in the woodshed. Think it must have come from deep inside a forest, cause it's damp and green and leaves are still reflecting in its eyes. I fed it on many things, tried grass, the roots of stars, hazelnut and dandelion, but it stared up at me as if to say, I need food you can't provide. It made a nest among the coal, not unlike a bird's but larger. It is out of place here, and is most time silent. If you believed in it, I would come hurrying to your house to let you share this wonder, but I want instead to see if you yourself will pass this way. The last poem. It's a poem about belief, about love, whatever. I mean, you can translate the poems anywhere you want to read. Angel Wings, it's called. In the morning I opened the cupboard and found inside it a pair of wings, a pair of angel's wings. I was not naive enough to believe them real. I wondered who'd left them there. I took them out the cupboard, brought them over to the light by the window and examined them. You sat in the bed in the light by the window grinning. They are mine, you said. You said that when we'd met, you'd left them there. I thought you were crazy. Your joke embarrassed me. 
Nowadays, even the mention of the word angel embarrasses me. I looked to see how you'd stuck the wings together. Looking for glue, I plucked out the feathers. One by one, I plucked them till the bed was littered. They are real, you insisted, no longer smiling. And on the pillow, your face grew paler. Your hands reached to stop me. But for some time now, I've been embarrassed by the word angel. For some time, in polite or conservative company, I've checked myself from believing anything so real and yet so untouched had a chance of existing. I plucked then till your face grew even paler. Intent on proving them false, I plucked, and your body grew thinner. I plucked till you all but vanished. Soon beside me in the light, besides the bed in which you were lying, was a mass of torn feathers, glueless, unstitched, brilliant, reminiscent of some vague disaster. In the evenings I go out alone now. You say you can no longer join me. You say without wings it's not possible. You say ignorance has ruined us. This belief is slaughtered. You stay at home, listening on the radio to sad and peculiar music. Who fed on belief, who fed on the light I'd stolen. Next morning when I opened the cupboard, out stepped a creature, blank, dull, idiotic, and too briefly sensual. It brushed out the feathers gloating, I must review my disbelief in angels. Smashing Brand. Brand, when did, when did you first get interested in poetry? When did you first sort of think about it at all? I suppose it was a feeling there that was very undefined and eventually it came out as poetry. And poetry is a way of of expressing something, but the actual essence of it is always there. I suppose, as listening on the radio, I suppose I was about 13, and I was listening on the radio to a poem by, by Yeats, I think, and it was Leader and the Swan, yeah. and I remember my grandmother thinking it was like, um, well, almost a pornographic poem, and making them switch the radio up, and that got me more and more interested. Yeah. Mm. Mm. But did anyone in your family write at all or read poetry? Anyway. No, it's really, you know, not really, not at all, you know, not into it. Well, what was the first, when you started writing poems, which I suppose you did secretly, like most people, like me, um, when was the first time you showed one to anyone who, who sort of liked it at all? How did that happen? I suppose, um, more or less when it left school, going into into the city, away from the like the school environment, going into town, into clubs, into various places. Yeah. I came I came across I thought I was a freak. I didn't realise there was lots of other people who did things like that. You know, and I, I found them eventually. Luckily mm -hmm. lots of freaks. Mm -hmm. Well no. some good freaks. Yeah. Okay. Well thanks a lot, Brian Patton. Here you go. Thanks. <laughs>